Getting a coach is one of the places where senior level leaders betray their value for modeling good leadership more than any other. You know, they know they're supposed to be successful. They know they're supposed to be assertive. They know they're supposed to delegate. They know they're supposed to do all these things, but they don't realize that they're supposed to invest in their own leadership development. And the leaders who do, they're walking examples of how much easier it is to help other people grow when their teams see them investing in themselves. Oftentimes, I find that 80 to 90% of the time when I first talk to an executive, they have some sort of a goal, but it's not really a vision or a passionate vision. It's not something that they really deeply care about. And if you can help someone connect to what they really care about, they're often more willing to hear the hard thing. It's amazing how many leaders want their team to get coached, but they want to, they don't want to get coached themselves. It's like, let's, let's just grab that snippet and post it on all the socials. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have time. They, they... Welcome to today's episode of Dr. Patty Ann's podcast. And today I have not one, but two guests that I know you're going to love. I'll just tease you with their J&J team. And since I know you're going to like this podcast, make sure you like, comment, share, and subscribe. So today, I have somebody who is a best-selling author, a serial entrepreneur, and a coach, along with his partner, his business partner, an executive coach, and a keynote speaker. So Rather than them, then have me ramble on, allow me the pleasure to introduce to you Jason Jaggard and Janet Brettenbach, the CEO and founders and partners of Novus Global. Welcome, Jason and Janet. Hi, Penny. And th- Thank thanks, you. Thanks for having us on the show. Yeah. You're welcome. And, and for my listeners here, um, Janet, this is right before the Super Bowl. So Janet is fortunate enough to be hailing from Kansas City. So you Swifty lovers or haters, go ahead, do your thing. And yep. Jason is from all my listeners know what I consider to be the center of the universe, New York City. <laughs> so we ha- as I'm in Florida right now. So we have a wide range that we're yes. uh, representing. That's right. You're the only one with right. any tax sense. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So uh-huh. I, my listeners know, I like to start differently. So here's my question. And I'd like both of you to answer it. It doesn't matter who goes first. You ready? Imagine you have a huge box in front of you. And within that box is everything in your entire life that you have ever lost. What would you reach for first and why? Mm. Whoever wants to go first can go first. Mm. I'm thinking about that. Yeah. J- Janet, you want me to go first? You want to, you want yeah. to go first? Swing on this? Yeah. yeah, go for it. I want to, I want to hear yours. I think uh, I, hang I, on, I think Jason. I, I should maybe make Jan, I should maybe make Janet write down her answer so she doesn't fudge it when it's her turn. I got it. Right I'm down. I'm on it. Great idea. There you go. Great idea. Okay. Okay, you know, Jason. There's two I do categories. that with my executives, by the way, when I have an executive team. Oh, Otherwise, yeah. they'll all just follow the leader, you know? <laughs> yeah. So there's two categories here for me that came up. One was, uh, l- l- this may not be answering the question because it can't fit in a box, but uh, losing any opportunity to have been more kind than I was. And so there's, there are lots of opportunities. And, you know, uh, I think back at some friendships and I think back to like the moments in my life when I, um, am the least proud of the choices that I made that Mm -hmm. it was, it is almost always a lost opportunity to be kind. Can you give us an example of the, can you give us an example of a and we've all made choices that we are not proud of. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, uh, I had a fallout with a friend uh, years, a couple of years ago. And on the one hand, I was, it was one of those situations where our, our, our values had changed. You know, we, we weren't, um, we weren't c- close anymore, but there was kind of the semblance of like pretending to be friends and history. You had so much history. That's right. And he actually initiated, he reached out and he said, Hey man, like, can we get together and talk? And I said, yeah, absolutely. We can. And so we did. And I appreciated that. And then I just mapped it out for him. I was like, Hey, like, 
uh, I know you want to be closer in this season of life. And I said, it doesn't feel like all the things that you'd want to do to be close uh, aren't my thing. And and so I'm trying to figure out the only way for us to be closest for me to come into your world versus creating either a, a shared world or trying to figure out like a 50, 50 split. And, um, he wasn't interested in that. And that was really the last time we ever spoke. And I think that if I could go back and do it over again, on the one hand, I was proud of myself for being assertive. I was proud of myself for mapping it out. I was proud of myself for, um, bringing up the conversation. Uh, and I think when he got defensive and he got shut down and all that kind of stuff, I, I, I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> you know, like if you don't, if you can't, if you know, if you can't have this mm-hmm. conversation, then we're done. And I think maybe, maybe like a little more garnished or a little extra ounce, a little extra communication could have saved the friendship. Uh, I don't, I don't believe, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know if it would have, but uh, it, it might have. And so I think there's some regret there uh, mm-hmm. around, around just not a little extra percentage of kindness or compassion or, or, or gentleness or, going a little further would have um, at the very least would have given me a, a more clean conscience uh, coming mm-hmm. out of that experience. Mm-hmm. May I, may I jump in with that? Sure. So when you said 50, 50, I thought right away, well, nothing in life is 50, 50. If maybe you could have ebbed and flowed 60, 40, 70, 30 kind of thing, but it depends upon what the different values are. But what would you ever, if, if you regret that, would you ever consider revisiting it? And why not? Um, I think I've moved on. You know, so if, if, if there's like a 12 step amends process, it would be in being kind to the people who are in my life now versus going back and revisiting mm-hmm. something from the past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I can, and it tells us so much about, I'll, I'll tell you more after. Um, Janet, okay. please share. Uh, the thing that popped up in my mind was a uh, musical improv, hmm. <laughs> which, uh, is something that, um, I stopped doing and it's just a very, very fun, uh, creative endeavor for me. Um, and it's a piece of me and a piece of my personality and my life that I miss. And I think about often, uh, and there's actually, I mean, I've, I've had thoughts recently it, for some reason it just hasn't fit in my life or I haven't made the commitment to, uh, to put it back into my life recently. And, and I miss that. So, um, when you said something that you lost for some reason, that's, that's the thing that popped up. It's like a, a, a piece of who I am that I feel like I lost, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that I enjoy when did you, if, if if I may, when did you lose it and why did it fall off? Yeah. It's not so much we lose something like that. We just don't prioritize it. Exactly. As any working mother would tell you, you're last on the list if you're on the list at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, gosh, it's about how old am I? 40. So about, uh, about exactly 10, 11, 11 years ago that uh so a woman's I, life looks very different in her 30s than in her 40s yeah right? absolutely absolutely yeah and technically i guess th- i did most of this in my 20s so i dropped it when i turned just before turning 30 um and part of that was just because of a big uh life change so i went through a very difficult divorce um at age uh 30 well i got separated at 29 uh and you know, there were parts of who I was and myself that I was super ashamed of at the time. There were things that I had done, uh, mistakes that I had made. And there was a part of me that was like, that was because of the world that I was in, that I was involved in, mm-hmm. which involved uh, being in in the, the comedy world. And at the time, I was uh, young, immature, and not grounded in who I was. So uh, I associated a lot of the mistakes I made with the world that I was in. So I, it's almost like I quit cold Turkey. I was like, all right, I need to figure out who I am, uh, where I'm going who I want to be. Um, and part of that included quitting that part of my life. It was quitting the world, not, it wasn't the art, but quitting the world. Um, and yeah, I went on a journey and, and it, it's, it served me. I've, I've created a really beautiful life and career and I'm, 
Uh, I feel way more equipped than I ever have been to have deep, fulfilling relationships. And I'm remarried and I'm happily remarried. And so, um, but yeah, there's, there's an element of that that I'm beginning to, uh, rediscover and allow to, to bud, uh, within myself again. So I'm, 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 uh, that's kind of like the season I'm in in the last six months is like, oh, how do I want to incorporate, uh, creativity back into my life, uh, or at least that aspect mm-hmm. of creativity. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, I'm struck because there's a lot of, of research and you probably know this, Jason, where not necessarily, I'm not familiar with the musical improv part, but regular improv is but it, the way it creates the neural pathways in the brain and the consistency of doing that is so tied to learning and learning new skills and really that whole concept of a growth mindset. Um, so it sounds like you might be ready to re-enter it, right? Sometimes we have to really distance ourselves from something mm-hmm. and then say, you know, get grounded again and say, okay, I can let you back in, but now it's on yeah. your terms. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Jason, you look at you and say something. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Well, one is I, I heard a stat recently that said that when you're having fun, you uh, it takes 10 times, you learn 10 times faster when you're having fun. And I think that's mm-hmm. fascinating. And also just to say this, you know, in our firm, you know, we have around 40 coaches in different parts of the country in North America. And um, we're doing, we're having conversations right now around how do you bring your creativity, your, your passions, your uniqueness, you know, to your work. And I've known Janet mm-hmm. almost all of those years. I may have met you uh, in your twenties. I can't remember, but oh, yeah. certainly, yeah. yeah. So I've known you for a long time. And it is interesting in terms of, you know, you going through almost like a, there was this like LA fun, mm-hmm. you know, party Janet <laughs> and not mm-hmm. like party hardy, but like, you know, just like a fun, yeah. fun Janet, you know, kind of thing. And then, then she became professionalized, honestly, like now the, the 28 year old Janet would not recognize the 40 year old Janet as Janet travels the world and works with, you know, whether it's professional athletes or some of those famous people on earth or with multi, multi-billion dollar companies, there's like now, now, you know, even if, if people can see this, there's like turtleneck Janet, there's like Steve Jobs Janet, <laughs> you know, and, and now it's fun to see like her bring, now that she's established herself professionally, now there's like a, okay, I wonder what role that mm-hmm. fun, playful, uh, creative spirit will have in this new professional mm-hmm. setting. And, mm-hmm. and one of the nice mm-hmm. things about being a part of our community is we get to figure that out together. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I want all the listeners to see, I want to recognize what Jason just did here. I like never do this, but I just have to. Jason told me before we came on the air that he always likes to have a partner with him. And I'm like, that's cool. He's like, you know, thanks for letting me bring someone else along. I'm like, yeah, why not? Like, you know, I certainly do not. I I live outside the box. Like I don't color by the rules at all. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, why not? Uh, and I'm like, I don't know, maybe he's not supposed to have somebody else here. What do I know? It's only my podcast, but I don't always make all the rules, right? <laughs> <laughs> what <But with> Jason, <laughs> right? We're all in control of our own lives all the time. But what Jason just did was he just operationalized what he told me offline, mm. which was he made it a point to acknowledge Janet and her growth and who she was to whom she's grown into. And anticipating in a very exciting way who she will be in the future. And I imagine that's the skill set as another executive coach that you, you bring to your work. So Janet, can, can you talk about that and tell me, no, I'm totally wrong. Like you don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah. No, I think that's a big, big uh, element of being an executive coach. Uh, I mean, among other things, but it's, um, I think what I hear you saying is just the ability to both affirm the growth that you're seeing in someone, especially in our clients, and also really help aid in painting a picture of the future of who that person wants to be, um, who they who they could be. Um, it's it's this um, um, celebrating the progress and continuing to ask like, all right, what's next? What's the next level mm-hmm. of the video game? Like what, where are we going? What do we want to build? What do we want to create rather than hanging out in nostalgia, which I, 
uh, feels really good for me. I, I love being nostalgic. I love uh, thinking about how things were in the nineties and, uh, and how they're so different now. And, um, and uh, if I hang out there too long, I, I get stagnant and I stop building. Um, right. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause we get comfortable in what's in what we know, right. We know yeah. what the past was, mm-hmm. right. But when you're comfortable, you don't grow. I sort of kind of can be dramatic. I like to say when you're comfortable, you sort of kind of start to die. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're not growing. Well, well yeah. So, it's, it's Jason, you uh, look like you want to say something. Well, it's the gospel according to uh, Shawshank Redemption, right? Like either get busy living, <laughs> yeah. get busy living or get busy dying. And what, what I can tell you from being coached by Jana over the past few years is there is a degree of um, pulling out the best in you and and also like a frank honesty about when you are uh, falling short of your own ideals, you know, like there's a, you know, I don't, I don't know how it works with you, but I, the, the coaches I really enjoy being around are the ones who gently and kindly say the thing that no one else will say to you uh, that you already kind of probably mm-hmm. know about yourself. But now mm-hmm. that it's in the context of a relationship, now you can do something about it. And mm-hmm. it's amazing what people can accomplish when, when they're willing to put themselves in environments where people say brave things to them. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting you say that. So, Janet, we have a lot to talk about because my reputation is for having a thundering velvet hand. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I'm known and, and I, I know this because this is what people have said to me, you know, I'm this little small petite woman, but, you know, I have these really successful, many times powerful executives that I speak truth to power that nobody else will. And, you know, I have different ways to say it. I might start with like, don't hate me because I'm beautiful. <laughs> and then you slam them, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, but I, I could see how it's interesting because I'm feeling like, wow, I think your musical improv is still very much alive and well in your business and your mm. practice, but you're just not consciously aware of it, right? Because there's different ways you go. I have a professional musician that I coach now, or I would never know this, but the way music gets softer to set you up for the big. And I don't know all the terms he would cringe because he taught me them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's quite deliberate, although it might appear ad lib. So how do you, how do you play that into your work? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's true actually, because I help train, uh, new coaches as well. And I help them to understand and learn the craft of coaching. And I often very much, um, associate it with the art of improv um, because there is a oh, lot okay. of, yeah, there, there's a lot of learning how to take uh, what is coming at you or what, what you're sitting in front of, like just the energy, the questions, the whatever is in front of you. And oftentimes you don't know how a client is going to react to a question mm-hmm. or um how they're going to feel and the ability to yes and and if if you're not familiar um mm-hmm. with that phrase it's very popular uh improv term it's probably used outside of improv a lot but um uh it was more widely coined in Tina Fey's book about her journey of uh of building her career and it's one of the fundamental lessons you learn when you learn how to do improv comedy and it's to yes and and it's learning how to not say no but <laughs> um and when you're coming in with that kind of energy where you're antagonistic uh, as we all probably know it often doesn't create a lot of great results but um i find that philosophy to be something that's helped me in conversation that's helped me in life um to flow with what's happening and to add to it uh, rather than resist uh, what is. Um, and mm-hmm. when I, when I'm digging my heels into resisting what is, it usually doesn't create uh, mm-hmm. the the environment that I want with a relationship. It doesn't create um, results with a client. And so absolutely there's a level of, um, of, I, I felt this on a on a call with a client yesterday. There was an aspect of we're creating music together as well. There's mm. there's um there's a fun, there's a play, there's a there's a there's a adding to uh and it's it's yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing. If you've ever watched an improv comedy show, uh most people know that it could be you're you're looking at one of two very different experiences. It's either going to be so 
cringy because if, if it's not good, if an improv show is not good, it's painful <laughs> um, because either they're not yes anding, uh, you know, they're they're in their heads. Uh, what the cool thing about improv is if it's good, the audience is in it with you. And it's it's like stand up. If it's good, you it's funny and it's great. But, you know, they plan that. Uh, if an improv show is good, half of the, the, the joy and the giggling within you is coming from the fact that, you know, they're making this up on the spot. So if it's funny and you know that it's making it up on the spot, it's like this orchestra crescendo that is just like, what is happening? Um, and that's what it often feels like on a call when it's like, whoa, what did we just create? I can't believe we just came up with that. Um, so if you get a chance to definitely go see an improv show. Huh. I said, well, Great one of my thing. sons, one of my sons did improv. So that's how I was okay. familiar with it. And I, nice. I do want to ask you about that call you just made, but I will tell you, you know, doing a lot of the work that you do, right. Which is why I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this conversation. <laughs> Even though it's supposed to be about you, I hope you're loving the conversation. But I use the, you know, there's a lot of when I do communication exercises, there's so many fancy and there's all this jargon around communication. I'm like, we're talking about communication. Can you keep it simple? One of the best exercises I use in workshops is yes and. Mm-hmm. And th- depending upon the number of people, you have to do yes and. And the people realize, wow, it is really hard to remember to listen, knowing you're going to have to add to it. Yeah, And it is such a powerful exercise that I, I just find it one of the absolute best ones that you can use. So my question, and and it can go to either one of you is because I do coaching with entrepreneurs and and executives. And it's, it's very, it's a rare person that can do both because there are two different languages. It's, it's, there's a common denominator, but there's also different skill sets. You know, an entrepreneur, you will never hear about trying to meet quarterly numbers like, oh my God, whereas executives for the most part, certainly if they're publicly traded, that's it's it's such a broken business model, but that's everything is by that driven by that. So my experience has been with a lot of executives at, at every level is, you know, you want to bring out the the truth is in the the ad lib, right? The truth is in what's not rehearsed. Mm-hmm. But it's so difficult to get them off of their talking points, right? Like you have to have a strategy, you have to have a structure. But to get them to acknowledge it's not working (laughs) and you need to pivot. And there's usually a huge ego involved, evidenced by I get paid so much money. So, of course, I must be so smart, he says sarcastically. Hmm. What's the tool that you use to, you know, respectfully tell, not even suggest that what everybody else knows they're not acknowledging it's not working. You want me to take a swing, Janet? Yes, please. Well, there's a there are several I'm tools. Like, it's, it's a it's an easy question. I know. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all right. There's several tools, um, and I'm sure you you know about this just as well as as any any coach who's worth their salt. There's a uh, you, you can you can go. Uh, some people will only respond if you are caustically disruptive. And so if you can build a container with someone where they know that they're paying you good money for you to advocate for them, you can actually say something that's almost like a, you know, uh, I heard a long time ago, someone say that a good, a good sermon is like aftershave, it stings and then it soothes. And whether, whether mm-hmm. sermons are like that or not, uh, I don't know, but uh, good coaching is that way sometimes is it stings and then it soothes because I think mm-hmm. that executives are desperate for someone to be honest with them because they know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that people are disincentivized. The more powerful and successful you are, the more people are disincentivized to be honest with you. And so I think that's that's one piece. Um, I, I have a few more, but Janet, do you want to you want to say anything or, or say some of your tools? No, yeah. I mean, um, if I'm hearing a cr- the question correctly, it's it's what happens when uh, when someone doesn't seem to be aware of how they're getting in their own way is that is that the question that's a part of it yes okay beautiful beautiful yeah i mean um that's what i love uh, about the function of vision um it oftentimes i find that in 80 to 90 percent of the time when i first talk to an executive they have some sort of a goal um but it's not really a 
a vision or a passionate uh, a, a passionate vision. It's not something that they really deeply care about. Um, and if you can help someone connect to what they really care about, they're often more willing to hear the hard thing. Um, and, and especially if they can feel, see, taste it in the future, you know, oftentimes I have people who come in, yeah, five years from now, 10 years from now, uh, which feels like I've got all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, to build that or to create that. But once we put something uh, on, on the map for them to hit in the next six months, in the next, in the next year that they truly care about, that truly lights them up. Uh, oftentimes the path towards finding out what I don't know that I don't know uh, becomes mm -hmm. really clear. Reveals itself. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, then the example that you gave, you know, like the person who's like the, the strategy they're employing that's not working. Uh, this is another tool. You know, it's interesting. Most executives are playing like 50 games of chess at the same time. And it's like a game of speed chess. And one is they don't realize that's what they're doing. And so they're having to be decisive. They're having to make decisions quickly. And so they tend to lack a, an awareness of where they're avoiding things, where they're even scared mm -hmm. of things. And they probably would never use that word because I'm not scared of things. But avoidance is usually a good sign of that. And also, they tend to be really disconnected from uh their emotions and so with with some i, I like to say with our coaches oh my gosh uh, some, i have to interrupt you i i have please. to i just wrote a blog i just wrote a blog i don't know when it's coming out about debunking the myth that emotions have nothing to do with business exactly oh yeah go ahead that's yeah, great we'll put right? that link in the show right. notes yeah so people can check that out the yeah. <laughs> it's important right and and so usually there's two types of coaching i'm sure there's a thousand types of coaching but there's the people who struggle to get things done and they need someone to kind of like defibrillate them and get them excited and get them motivated and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I like yeah. that. Defibrillate. <laughs> they do walk around like the living dead. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then there's people that are already go-getters and they're already winning. And the thing that they need, so the person who's going slow, they're afraid of going fast. The person who's going fast, they're actually afraid of going slow. And so right. I like to, usually when I meet someone whose mind works really fast, which is most executive leaders, I want to create a space mm -hmm. where we can really slow down and they can see the chess moves they're making and they'll start spotting the errors in thinking and rationale and strategy mm -hmm. if you could just create they don't they don't they can go 100 miles an hour the rest of the week but for 1 hour we're going to slow this down to a walking pace and you know Jana just moved into a new city and so did I and, and she's kind of walking the neighborhood and it's amazing how like in LA which is where her and I are both from uh you drive around I mean LA is a car city and you're driving around all the time yeah. And it's amazing when, like, if you ever your car breaks down, or in LA, if it gets towed, which is kind of a rite of passage in Los Angeles, and you have to walk somewhere, all the details and all the little shops and the personality and everything that you're missing, typically because you're going too fast. And I find that yeah. if leaders can just slow down for one hour a week, uh, mm -hmm. they will discover things about themselves and about others, and you know, logic back patterns are running that are not mm -hmm. true, assumptions they're making that are not true, et cetera, et cetera, that really help them. Uh, get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. mm. Absolutely. Okay. So you, you just brought up something that, um, again, this is why I love these podcasts because I had no idea I would go here. You know, never before have we had more ways to communicate than we've communicated so poorly in the history of man, right? And part of it, there's many, many reasons for that. But I think a big part of it is there's no time for anything because we're all in a rush. Now, Jason, you and I as New Yorkers, right? Like nobody personifies being in a rush more than me. Guilty as charged. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, and, and we also know that you know, most of us aren't breathing, right? Because we are in a rush. Either we're holding our breath or we're hyperventilating. So in today's fast paced pace world, where you do have to play chess, you do have to play chess. But you feel, you feel as if the clock is ticking in checkers because time is so critical. How do you get the busy, for the most part, successful executive to see the value in what, it, what was that book? Think fast to go slow or something like that. Thinking fast to go slow. How do you get the busy executive to understand that no? The old, the old adage, you know, measure twice, cut once. Hmm. It's all you, Janet. It's good. Yeah. I, I mean, how do you <laughs> is an interesting question. Uh, how do we? How about that? Yeah. How do we? 
<laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a great question. Um, uh, I just had an uh, a former client text me yesterday uh, asking, hey, Janet, there's someone I'm working with who I think really needs to work with you, but I don't know how to say it to them hmm. uh, because they haven't given me permission yet. <laughs> uh, but I can just see it that, man, they really need to talk with someone, they, whether it's a coach or, or something. Uh, By the way, that's it. an incredible compliment to you, Janet. So <laughs> it's to a, you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, well, and it, it was just fun to process that with her. Like, how how does she basically broach a conversation that, hey, I think you need to slow down, or I think you need to slow down to talk to someone because I'm seeing things about your leadership that uh are getting in your way which by the way even the way i phrase that most people don't know to phrase it that way like hey i think this is getting in your way most of the time we'll just kind of without permission share our opinion and people resist that and it's what i did all in my 20s was i tried to give unsolicited advice because i thought why well, if they just listen to what i say their lives will be better and it didn't work and then I well, well, we all know everything <laughs> when we're in our twenties. It's amazing exactly. how dumb we get. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, again, that's why you know rapport building is so great. You know, so it was fun to talk her through. Hey, start with curiosity. Um, I'm guessing that this person that you think needs a coach uh, might be in pain, and they just don't know it yet. They don't know what they need. They don't even know the depth of the cost of how they're showing up. So start with questions rather than advice or opinions. Mm -hmm. Start with, hey, how are you? Like, um, hey, I noticed that you have brought this challenge up multiple times. Are you talking to anyone about that? Mm -hmm. um, is this something that you'd like help with? Um, can I give you some feedback? Or I just start with questions, questions, mm -hmm. questions. Because oftentimes when we start with uh, like a really deep level of curiosity, with someone that we can see and maybe they can't see yet that they need help or that they need to slow down, uh, that usually will create an opening where I often find people will lean in and I'll go, actually, yeah, what do you think? What do you think? Um, so that's a good place to start. Yeah. And, you know, she's touching on uh, a few things. So we, so you mentioned a, a book uh, that we wrote at, at the top of the episode. It's a, it's a USA Today bestseller, which we're really excited about. And um, one don't worry, we'll get to the book. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> one of the, one of the things that we talk about in there is um, there's a whole chapter. It's, it's, a, it's an executive coaching book, and there's a whole chapter on love, which surprises people when well, they read it. Give the title. Give the give, oh. give the title. So yeah, it's called Beyond High Performance: What Great Coaches Know About How okay. to Best Get Better. And <laughs> thank you. Right. And in it, we talk about oftentimes in leadership, you're focused on what you want from people. You know, I want this email done by this time, I want you to hit this, these numbers, these quarterly numbers. You know, I want you to get this project done. I want you to so show me your 90 day plan, all that kind of stuff. Those are things mm -hmm. I want from people. And oftentimes uh, in, in coaching, and Janet's very good at this, you want to pivot from what do you want from somebody to what do you want for people? And so you want to mm -hmm. dial into, you know, if, you, if you're trying to help somebody, you want to really connect to what I, I, I want this person to be successful in this role. I want this person. I want this person to perform so well that I never want them to leave, and I'd be even willing to give them a raise because they were able to increase our revenue by this, this, and this. And when you lock into that kind of way of being, it really they they will smell it, they will feel it in their body in ways that uh, that, that they can't even mm -hmm. explain. And then it really does open things mm -hmm. up. And one of the things I love about our coaches and also Janet specifically is when just how quickly someone feels like she's for them in a conversation. And then that allows a curiosity because by the way, you can be curious and antagonistic at the same time. Uh, you, sure. you can't be curious. We call that nosy. Time. We call that nosy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's like, why are you asking me? That's this someone, that's the yeah. different. Yeah, yeah, that's right. What's your, what, what's your real question behind yeah, that? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. That is great. <laughs> I actually, I, I actually just thought of something as you, as you were both speaking and so what, um, one is that you touched upon it, and all of my work is predicated upon this, and I know yours is as well, to be able to do everything you just said is, and you can do it quickly, right? Um, you have to establish trust. And you establish that trust by asking the, the question coming from a place of empathy, right? So without trust, you're dead in the water. You, you, like, you know, so your friend, your former client that called you, 
she could do everything you said and everything you suggested is a thousand percent correct. But if their relationship is antagonistic, to use Jason's word, it's not going to happen, right? And sometimes it's that dynamic that's the issue. So we don't, you know, we, we don't know. Um, yeah. I tend to also go with, I, I, many times when you have to give somebody her advice and you guys set the tone for the podcast with this, you share where you, you did something less than optimal, hmm. right? So like, you know, you, you're the meta performance institute. If you want someone to admit a lack of performance, they're yours, hmm. right? So if you say to somebody, look, I, I was in these shoes. I struggled so much. And I employ, how do you say, I employed a coach. I don't know if you ever thought about that, right? Hmm. And hmm. you're joining with them and you're now giving them permission to say, wow, I need help. And not only, wow, do I need help? You got help too, which leads me to this question that drives me insane, quite frankly, frankly, why on God's green earth does someone feel like coaching when they're offered coaching? It's punitive. Mm -hmm. You better get coached because you're putting on a performance plan as opposed to what I tell my people is what a gift you're being given. So, so help us understand that. Yeah, there's, that's, well, there's two things you said that really resonate with, with us. One is um, this idea that just the last thing you said in terms of being punitive versus an opportunity, but also, you know, it, it's fascinating how many people want other people around them to get coached, but they don't want to get coached. And Well, it's like therapy too. You need therapy, not me. <laughs> that's right. And so it is a, so if you're listening to this and you're a senior level executive, you know, it is worth hiring a coach for you just so that you can have a degree of, I'm going to use the phrase like moral authority with your team mm -hmm. when you want them to get coaching. Cause then it's like, Hey, look, like this isn't because you're bad or wrong or broken. Like I'm, I'm doing it too. Like I'm getting coaching. This is helping me. I want to share this experience with you modeling. Yeah. I find that coaching is getting a coach is one of the places where senior level leaders uh, betray their value for modeling good leadership more than any other. You know, they know they're supposed to be successful. They know they're supposed to be assertive. They know they're supposed to delegate. They know they're supposed to do all these things. Um, but they don't realize that they're supposed to invest in their own leadership development. And uh, and the leaders who do, and, you know, Janet and I, we have, I mean, in the firm, we have over 300 clients right now. And they're walking examples of how, how much easier it is to help other people grow when their teams see them investing in themselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. I, my mind's just like uh, going, yeah, my mind's go. going through a, a Rolodex of of people. I'm thinking I want to grab that clip of like it's amazing how many leaders want their team to get coached, but they want to they don't want to get coached themselves. Just like let's let's just grab that snippet and post it on all the socials. They don't have time. <laughs> they, they, to what we said earlier, they don't have yeah. the time. They mm -hmm. don't. They're so busy and it's so important. Yeah. 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 What is, that's what. Yeah, go ahead, Jana. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say, yeah, it, it's such a, a a beautiful way to model uh, to model what we want from our team. Um, so, like you said, uh, Doctor Patty Ann. Sorry, I was like Doctor Patty Ann. That's, that's a lot of syllables. <laughs> uh, they call me, well. I'm called my, my, my clients call me DPA. They call me DPA. I'm I'm sure they call oh. me other things. Okay, they call got me DPA, it. Cause just got it. Got it. I like that. It's we're in a rush. Yeah. Like you said, DPA, uh, um, the, there's a level to which, um, if, if you start with ownership in, in any breakdown, really, um, I find it to be a, just a great relational, uh, tool, as long as you're not using it to manipulate, you know, like, like Jason said, people can sniff it if you're, um, if the intention behind it is man manipulation or you're wanting something from them versus, Hey, like, let me just share like the part that I played in this, like, here's how I contributed to this breakdown. I find it to be a great way to build that trust or, or to build that rapport. So um, ownership is a, is a great place to start. Mm. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I think that is great for people from a, from a self-awareness perspective, right? Like, you know, many times we're the problem, you know, and, and the, or the issue. And the, the other thing is people tend to, I keep losing my, what, oh, 
one of the biggest things that I find executive coaching is helpful for, and I'd like to know if you if you experience this, helping an executive, and again, further up the food chain you go, the more I think this is necessary. Helping the executive, I'll use this term, manage the people that are trying to manage them mm. or the people that have their own hidden agenda. I'm working with somebody now and there's someone internationally that Clearly, it is as clear as day outside looking in is trying to manage him for his own agenda, not for the sake of the company. And it's really hard to see that. You know that expression, you can't read the label when you're inside the jar. Do do you see that or is that just something that like that's just unique to my experience? Yeah, no, absolutely. I I think that's where feedback becomes really valuable too. And a lot of people av- avoid it, resist it, find ways to invalidate it. Um, it's mm-hmm. uh, what one of the favorite um, uh, kind of tools that I love that we uh, utilize or or teach to teams and and help facilitate is the process of how to give and receive feedback. Um, hopefully aligned to a vision. Uh, otherwise it's just an opinion. Um, and like you said, if you're, mm-hmm. if you're inside the jar and you can't see the label, you know, we oftentimes we can't do surgery on ourselves. So that's why we need other people. We need other opinions. We, uh, one of my favorite things to do with an executive when I'm working with them is to ask them like, Hey, when's the last time you've asked for feedback from the people you're immediately working with, whether it's your colleagues or your direct reports or um, whoever it is. And again, usually if there's a vision and there's something at stake. By the way, Janet, what, what, what's, what's the answer you get to that question? The reason why I ask is my people have said, Oh, everybody, you know, everyone agrees with me. I'm like, really? Hmm. Uh, Who gives them their bonus? Like, do you think they're, you know, I mean, and there's a whole way of doing the group coaching, but I'm just, I'm just Mm. curious about that. What, what kind of discussion follows for you with that question? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. If so, if someone's pretty convinced that they're right, that everyone mm-hmm. agrees with me, uh mm-hmm. it, it right. It's first of all, again, you know, I'm I'm primarily going to ask if someone's curious about finding out what they don't know that they don't know. And if there's not that level of curiosity, if there's not that base, it's it's just going to be harder mm-hmm. to move faster. Um, and usually that might even be the feedback I give them is like, Hey, I'm not experiencing as very curious <laughs> right now. Um, and, and I can be wrong about that as well because mm-hmm. may, maybe they're right. Maybe everyone does agree with them. Uh, and, uh, if they're up to something that they care about and that they want and they want to know what they don't know, uh, you know, usually if there's enough trust there, the question becomes like, Hey, do you want to know what people are really thinking if you if you're sensing that people are not being forthright if you're sensing that people aren't being candid i have um i have a C- cmo right now who is frustrated because um we are doing this and she is curious and she keeps going to her team to ask for feedback and she's like i'm so frustrated they keep just telling me you're doing a great job i love it I, everything i love the way that you lead and she's like ah I, I want more feedback. And first of all, I just acknowledge her for that. Like just the fact that she's like wanting it. She's not settling for what she's getting. And, and also to receive that, hey, that's great feedback as well. You're doing a great job. It could be that the people you're asking feedback from aren't just very well practiced yet in really uh, excavating the the notices or the gaps that they're seeing yet. And so we're going to keep going. We're going to keep you know, who else can you ask? Uh, how can you be more specific in your request for feedback? Um, what exact, what Actually, kind Janet, of feedback I, you I get that. I get that all the time. And what I tell my executives is after they say that and you compliment them all, right? Then I'll say, okay, here's the deal, guys. Nobody's leaving this meeting until I get something that's not all rainbows and lollipops. Nice. Right. And when you give them, per- when you give them permission, then inevitably it will be, well, but it's not a big deal. But if you insist, right. Mm-hmm. And then the next comment is, and anything else. And that's when you get the, 
you know, the real information. But, but honestly, when I also get executives that, um, you know, everybody agrees with them. Absolutely. They've asked my, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll use this example. You, you know, maybe you're too controlling. Absolutely not. No, everyone agrees. Do you do me a favor? Go home and ask your spouse or the people that know you the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and come back to me on our next call. Mm-hmm. And and it's like, whoa, Jason, it looks like you want to say. Something. Well, you know, and yeah, as we're as we're giving people who are listening to this tools, you know, our team, we just flew in some of our top leaders uh, to LA for just one day, and we did a trust. The best part of what we did was a trust exercise where everyone in the room. Uh, I'm the check doctor. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was listening to some of your episodes, and one of the things we did was everyone rated each other on a scale of one to five um, Mm -hmm. on trust. And what and then what happened afterwards, which was really interesting, is they said, "What would it take for it to be a five? And people were able to talk to each other because you know, like I might give someone a four, and four is pretty good. And if so, if I'm looking for feedback, sometimes if I ask for feedback, you know, even like with Janet, I've asked Janet for feedback before, and she's like, "No, I think we're good." But if I said, "Well, rate me on a scale of one to five, and it's a four, and then I said, "Well, what would it take to make it a five? Well, now we have something to talk about, and mm-hmm. it's and mm-hmm. I love about that exercise with us. It was really productive. Is it's framed in a way I'm already admitting that I want, I would like for it to be a five, and then she's gonna give me feedback, not about what I've done wrong or anything like that, even though I may have done things that may have hurt her or, or, or eroded trust. But now she's giving it to me in a constructive way to help us both get our vision, which is we both would like for it generally to be a five. Um, now, actually, I want to I switch it for a second because you're, this, the, the question that you asked that led us down this path was around one of your clients who has like, a, like from their perspective, an antagonistic uh, team member who's trying to like manage them with their own secret agenda. I'm, I'm, but but he comes across but it's passive aggressive. Yeah, so that like right. cordial hypocrisy. Yeah. So then, yeah. So I'm yeah. curious because we haven't really touched on that yet. DPA, like what? What's your thing? Like, what do you do when you've got a client and they've got someone on their Wait, team? Are you interviewing me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I I I get a lot more information. I ask mm. a lot of questions, and then I speak truth to power. I have a thunder and velvet hand, so I will say something like, "I'm going to make the name up, John." Mm. Are you sure you want me to answer this question? What I think is going on? Hmm. And they say, yes. I said, okay. I said, do you want me to tell you in my 13 years of college way? Or do you want me to tell you my kid from Brooklyn way? Because <laughs> the kid from Brooklyn usually has an expletive, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and they almost always say both. And on the podcast, I will give you my college way. Okay. You're being manipulated. Hmm. Here's the key. A, B, E. You're being manipulated or you're, they're trying to manipulate you as evidenced by. Mm. And then I show them what's being done. And at this point, and my work is my only gift. I can't do anything else in life, but this is my gift. Mm-hmm. At this point, I've already developed a trusting relationship with the person. They know I have their back. Like I... I break all the rules. If you're supposed to have two calls a month, you can text me whenever you want. Like, I probably shouldn't say that, right? Because I want you to win. I want you to win. And, um, and then I say it as, by, as evidence by, and then they will see it. Right. And I'm saying everything might not be completely manipulative. And yes, there are pieces where the person is, it's in the best interest of the company, but be aware it's in the best interest of the company, but it's in the best interest of this person first. So I don't know. Does that work for you, or you have better? You have probably a million better suggestions for me. Well, th- this is what's fun about having the coaching conversation because everyone brings their unique experience and modalities mm-hmm. and things like that. So I like hearing. It's so much fun being in the community of coaches, and I'm sure on your podcast you get to talk to a lot of professional, like people in the, in the helping profession. And mm-hmm. uh, so before I respond to that, uh, Janet, like, do you, what are your initial thoughts on if someone is? from your perspective, you know, as it's occurring to you is manipulating or trying to manipulate your client. Yeah. I mean, my main thing is inviting them to get curious about what that person wants, because clearly that person wants something. Mm -hmm. And up until this moment, but honestly, Janet, everybody, but honestly, everybody wants something from them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. It's the the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. They want their job. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and it 
uh, results show that they're not willing to be direct about it. They they want to be passive aggressive about it. Hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So they there's something that they're afraid of. And so I'd be curious what that is. And so the the passive aggressive behavior, if we're taking full ownership of, okay, how am I contributing to this dynamic? I wonder, you know, whether it's by circumstance or the fact that I'm their boss and maybe they're afraid to be direct or um, maybe they're, have, they have scarce, they've got scarcity and they're afraid that if they don't get what they need, you know, every human is looking to thrive and survive. So... Uh, as as long as it's not a situation where this person needs to get fired, <laughs> if I'm still committed to advocate for this person's uh, best, uh, that's that's the place I'm going to come from. Is like, hey, I wonder what's go- truly going on for them, and is there a conversation that I have been holding back on? Is there is there feedback like, hey, I've noticed you've been passive aggressive? <laughs> um, is there feedback that I haven't given them? Um, so that we could have the real conversation, because otherwise it's just a bunch of <laughs> surface conversations. Yeah, and I don't know if this is a cop out or not, but when you first, d- a full disclosure, when you first presented that, I'm like, man, I don't know what I would do. You know, like I, I think my temperament naturally is to uh, assume that people are acting in good faith, and and so it would probably I would probably be very slow to the party to know if I was being manipulated by somebody. And so then there's a concept that we use a lot in our coaching uh, called believability. And we define that as a person who has uh, repeated experience navigating a certain situation and they can explain the mechanics of it. So there's two pieces there. And so probably my mind, and by the way, this wouldn't be my knee-jerk reaction. I wouldn't be thinking this had we not been talking about it right here. And I heard DPA, what you Mm -hmm. said, and then what Janet said. So it's not like I carry this around. I carry the believability. I love, I love his, I love your honesty, Jason. I just love your honesty. Well, you know, I, th- when you're on a podcast, you want to be like an expert, and 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 I think, and which is good because a lot of times we are experts, and also I think, I think with our coaches, one of the greatest forms of expertise is how quickly we can admit we don't know something, and so there is a, mm-hmm. a so I don't have a lot of experience working with, you know, s- sociopaths <laughs> uh, that that I'm aware of. But but I do know that there is expertise out there. And by the way, I think actually, and Jane and I've had a little conversation around this, and DPA, maybe you have too, like there are books and literature and things out there. So my first question to a client who's going through something like that is I would say, like, who do you know or what resources could we find for you that would increase your believability in how to deal with someone who may be toxic or um, you know, whether it's the I think that is Netflix like the no asshole rule, uh, or whether there's there's all these books out now, like the narcissist next door. You know, just how to how to discover whether the person is is misunderstood, hurt, wounded, or if they're dangerous, and then what to do. And so, probably what I would do if I had my if I was sober first, I'd probably try to give advice, and then I would fail. But then, I would, if I was sober, I would say, "Hey, like, let's. I don't know. You don't know. Let's go find resources together where you where you can find out and you can educate yourself to handle the situation. Something like that. I don't know. That's probably my honest answer mm-hmm. around that. Yeah, and I probably pull from my background as a clinical psychologist. That's right. Right. So I would consider myself, the, but, but yeah. to, to answer your question, I feel like we're all experts in learning. Mm, I like that. Like, like that, that's our expertise. We're experts in learning. Um, all right. So Jason and Janet, I, I'm, I don't know if you're game for this, but I would love to have another conversation with you. Like I really want to, um, I, I have goosebumps. I can't tell you how, how much this call resonates with me, this call, this podcast. I think I'm working, right? I mean, I think I'm coaching. <laughs> but, um, I, I, I really want to get to know both of you better. And I know, I, I know our listeners will too. So for the sake of time, I do want you to, both of you, unabashedly, and I mean unabashedly, promote yourselves, your work, your book where you want them to go get it, like all the things you thought you were going to talk about. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> well, I'll brag about Janet, if you don't mind. Um, so Perfect. You know what? Per- what a team. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and actually, Janet, if right. you want to talk about- Lay it on me. Talk, Lay it on yeah, me. If you, if you want to talk about uh, the book, maybe in the Institute, I'll talk about yep. you and the firm. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. Great. So- um, Teamwork man, makes the dream work. There you go. Right. <laughs> you know, um, if if every every coach is different, you know, and so if you're listening to this, DPA uh, is a good fit for probably many of your listeners. And so, first of all, hire DPA. If you're listening to this, 
higher DPA. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Please, she, she, you have she, a whole length to do for coaching. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, and you know, like we we want to advocate. Thanks for having us on your show, and that's an act of generosity. And we're in similar industries, and you know, I, I want to respect your pedigree as a clinical psychologist. And so, if you're looking for that, I know a lot of people like that's what they're looking for. They're looking for someone with a clinical background in psychology. And if you're listening to this, and that's you, then look no further. You found her uh, with DPA. And I want to brag about Janet for a while. Like Janet uh, is is one of our most trusted coaches in the firm, and she works with entrepreneurs. She works with people at companies like Nike. She works with uh, some of the, literally, literally, if you Google most famous people on earth, she has coached people on that list. And I highly recommend her. And then she represents, uh, she's a delegate on this call of a firm, a community of coaches with different backgrounds and different pedigrees and different experiences and things like that. And that's, you can go to novus.global uh, to mm-hmm. find out more about that. And then Janet, you want to tell them about our book and our podcast, maybe in the Institute? Yes, yes. I highly, highly recommend uh, checking out our book. Uh, what's great is it's also on Audible now. Um, it's called Beyond High Performance. It, you can purchase it on Amazon. Uh, what I love about this book, and I'm so proud of Jason and the work that he did with this book. Um, it's such a great, uh, it almost serves as like a um, uh, kind of like a handbook. Um, he combines storytellings with uh, storytelling with data with tools, uh, and for our clients, I love it because it's such a great resource to dig back into some of the tools that they learn in the coaching. So definitely grab a copy of that book if you're at all curious about our frameworks and how we work with uh, teams and leaders and athletes. It's a great way to get a glimpse into that. Um, and then if you go to mp.institute, uh, that's where we host everything for the Meta Performance Institute for Coaching. Uh, over there, we uh, get to train uh, humans how to learn how to coach and how to build a thriving practice. And that's the biggest el- element. Um, we were really passionate about building uh, a, a program that not only teaches you how to coach, because there's actually a lot, quite a few programs out there that teach you how to coach, but not a lot that teach you how to build a thriving practice. And you really get uh, almost like a, a um, think tank uh, for experiencing what it looks like to go with teams to build something rather than going alone. Uh, and so at M as in Mary P as in Paul dot Institute. Uh, there's a lot of great resources there and check out our, our podcast as well. If you can, by the same name as the book beyond high performance, uh, we have a lot of resources for uh, coaches and people who are looking to achieve great things. Boom. Great. DPA, thanks it for having us great. on your show. There it is. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, DPA. You. thank you so much. Jason Jaggard and, and Janet. Oh, yeah, I need my glasses on to say your name, right? <laughs> Breitenbach. It's a thing. Yeah, um, there we go. The, there we go. Nailed it. The, Breitenbach. The, the founder and CEO of Novus Global, and Janet is a partner at Novus Global, and I highly, highly recommend that you run to get beyond high performance. As people know that listen to this podcast, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors out there in the coaching world. Sometimes I'm like, what qualifies these people? I'm a little bit of a snob. So this information is absolutely um, need it. So Jason and Janet, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your wisdom and all the great work that you do in the world. I, I am so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You.